is Isadora Cruchain. I'm a PhD candidate in Urban Studies and International Development at MIT, and I'm very excited to be here today with Professor Catherine D'Ignacio uh, to talk about her book, Data Feminism, which was co-authored with Lauren Klein and published in 2020. Um, before we get to the book talk, uh, I just wanted to take a few uh, moments to uh, introduce Catherine. So Catherine is an assistant professor of urban science and planning at MIT. She's also director of the Data and Th Plus Feminism Lab, which uses data and computational methods to work towards gender and racial equity, particularly as they relate to space and place. Uh, Dinesio is a scholar, artist, designer, and a hacker mama, whose work focuses on feminist technology, data literacy, and civic engagement, uh, as pathways for which we can uh, use data to build a more just uh, and equ equitable society. Um, and I say that that's very much the spirit of the book as well. Uh, for those who have not yet had an opportunity to read the book, uh, Data Feminism is not simply the title of the book, but also a lens and set of principles through which we can think about how to approach data science in a way that understands that systemic inequalities uh, empower asymmetries along gendered, racial, sexual, and um, class lines uh, shape not only our world, but the data that we produce about it. Um, and as Catherine Laura, and Lauren uh, write in the book itself, data feminism is, and I quote, a way of thinking about data, both their uses and limits, that is informed by direct experience, by a commitment to action, and by intersectional feminist thought. Uh, so Catherine, the book is organized around seven guiding principles, uh, examine power, challenge power, elevate emotion and embodiment, rethink binaries and hierarchies, embrace pluralism, consider context, and make labor visible. And in discussing each of these principles in the book, you and Lauren not only seek to make existing biases in data science uh, visible, but also show and elevate concrete practical examples of how to challenge this power differentials in society and advance data justice uh, for grassroots activism. Uh, so I wanted, I wanted uh, us to start by uh, your telling us a bit about how, uh, what was your motivation for the book um, and how you developed these principles. Sure. Thanks, Isa. And thank you also to the American Geographical Society for, for the invitation uh, for today. Um, so our motivation for writing the book uh, really came about uh, because of the narrative circulated at the time that the book was conceived. So this is like five to seven years ago that I'm, I'm speaking about. Um, and folks may have heard of this uh, what is essentially a meme, uh, but you have all probably heard it if you're following these conversations around big data, uh, which is that uh, data data is the new oil is how the meme goes. Um, and we sort of pick on this one because it's it's very representative of um, these sort of techno heroic um, uh, sort of metaphors around data. So like data is the new oil um, sort of first came out in the late uh, 2000s. And then it was like kind of picked up and boosted by the economist, the magazine. Um, and if we think about it carefully, um, you know, uh, there's a metaphor here being used of extraction, right? Mm -hmm. Because oil uh, is an extractive industry. And in fact, many of the metaphors that we actually use as data scientists are extractive metaphors. So we extract, we mine, we process, uh, we um, clean, we refine, you know, and ultimately it's about um, taking what is essentially kind of like natural raw material or supposedly natural raw material and converting it into value. Um, and in the case of this, this sort of metaphor, and in many of these, these narratives circulating, it's really about um, profit. Um, and yet, at the same time, that, that profit that is being generated from the data economy um, and the methods by which it is on the data are extracted and used um, showcase these very profound asymmetries and who's actually um, benefiting um, uh, from this quote unquote, new oil. Um, and so one of the wonderful things I think about the past, um, let's say 10 years of scholarship um, that I think actually we're in a place where geographers have also led in, in this space is around the emergence of critical data studies um, and a kind of critical push back to these techno heroic and I would add very like sort of masculine narratives mm -hmm. about what is the power and potential of data and technology. Um, and so Lauren and I were really inspired by that, um, by this emerging scholarship and here I'm thinking of um, folks like Virginia Eubanks, uh, Sophia Noble, uh, Kathy O'Neill, Joy Bolamwini, folks are starting to say, in fact, um, data are 
not all that new, first of all, and our metaphors are not correct that we're using. In fact, what data are doing is um, exacerbating this kind of same old depression mm -hmm. that has always fallen along uh, race and class and gendered lines. And in fact, uh, might even be um, accelerating it and exacerbating it and kind of re-inscribing it into the world. So there's this way in which data are reproducing the same structural inequalities that already exist um, in important ways. And so Lauren and I felt like, okay, there's, there's this moment here um, where there's a lot to be learned from bringing an intersectional feminist lens into this equation. It's kind of like, what can we learn from um, feminist theory, but very specifically intersectional feminist theory, what does that have to offer us in this current moment where data are so powerful and are being taken up by such powerful institutions? Um, and what would data science look like if it were uh, grounded in a kind of feminist lens? And so that's, that's like the starting point for us. Mm -hmm. um, and the reason that we wrote the book was really this desire to um, say, what does an intersectional approach to data science uh, look like? And, and how is it already made manifest in the world? Like it's not this impossible vision that we could never realize it's actually is already happening. Mm -hmm. um, we just need to know where to look for it. <laughs> so. That's great. Um, I wanted one of the aspects that I wanted to bring up as one of the really fascinating and commendable things about the book um, is that it really embodies and exemplifies a lot of those principles uh, that you articulate in the book and that inspired your writing as well. Um, like, for example, embracing pluralism, like is very apparent in the book by your bringing of, an, of different voices, citing a very inclusive uh, body of scholarship, uh, very different uh, like references and citations. Um, and I think that is particularly relevant at a moment in which academic institutions are really trying to be more inclusive and more diverse in how they define and develop their curriculum, um, their programs and so forth. But the aspect that I thought was particularly cool and innovative about the book was like incorporating a participatory dimension into the writing. Mm -hmm. um, you put an early draft of the book online uh, at a public pl platform uh, where anybody could read it and provide comments. And you actually interacted with the users, uh, responded to your comments and then suggestions. Uh, so I wondered, I wondered if you could share a little bit more about what that process was like, um, just to put, to, like, what was it like to put the work out there, uh, to be held accountable in some ways, mm -hmm. uh, and how did you incorporate that back into the writing? Sure. Yeah, thanks. Um, yeah, so Lauren and I both felt strongly that we wanted our uh, book and our process to sort of embody those same feminist principles that we are writing about and sort of advocating that we have a normative stance, like this should be how things are done. Um, and so, so we did a couple of things in this regard. So we actually do, have, we have a value statement and we wrote that together that kind of guided the work. Um, we actually audited ourselves. <laughs> so we audited our citations for um, 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 along the lines of like a variety of axes of oppression in terms of like, who are we citing? Whose voices are we uplifting in the book? Mm -hmm. um, and then we had this open um, peer review process. And this was through MIT's platform, um, Pump Up, which is this open publishing platform um, that does versions of things. You publish a version and it can, it can be open and people can comment on it and so on. Um, and I have to say the first time when, it, you know, this was actually the press was at this moment where they were experimenting with the platform and they came to us and they said, would you all want to, um, you know, put your draft up and put it up for public comment, you know, in addition to doing like the regular peer review where like three or four people read the text and give you comments. Um, and we talked about it and I would say both of us were, uh, had a lot of trepidation. <laughs> this wasn't fully like, yay. <laughs> we're like, hmm, maybe you have to think about this because there's this way in which the work is not yet finished. You know, it's like there's a draft, but it's not, it's, it's not polished. It's not perfect. Not that it would ever be perfect, but um, uh, so there was like, there was definitely this moment of anxiety of like, you know, putting it out there. Um, but then I think when we talked about it further, we felt like this really resonated with the principle of embracing pluralism. And so this is a kind of feminist approach, um, which we can trace back to feminist scholars of science, um, folks like Donna Haraway, um, Sandra Harding, who have advocated for a kind of um, 
idea of feminist objectivity, where instead of like, you know, one person creating some kind of universal truth, um, we actually pool our standpoint. So we, we bring diverse perspectives together into the equation and pool those. And through this more robust understanding of kind of where people are coming from and what they're advocating for, we ultimately arrive closer um, to what could be considered a, a objectivity or maybe more like a consensual understanding of the truth <laughs> or something. Um, and so, so we felt like, okay, this is a good, we should try this. Um, and I'm very glad we did. We did have some fears about things like trolls and, mm -hmm. you know, uh, that, that kind of thing. Luckily that did not come to pass. Um, we, put the draft up there. It was open for, I think, three months or so of comments. Um, and we actually did architect some participation. So we invited um, mm -hmm. colleagues to be re peer reviewers of like individual chapters. And so that was a way we like, uh, we did very consciously architect some participation. Um, and then we also had lots of participation that happened just from people um, finding it, sharing it, commenting on it. Um, and it, we ran the gamut from everything from spelling mistakes. <laughs> so, like, so like there was a lot of helpful copy editing. <laughs> yeah, and we were like, no, okay, that's great. You know, like, that was very helpful that they corrected our errors. Um, but then we also had a number of people come in and say, well, yes, what about, but what about, you know, this citation or what about this body of work? Um, we had other people come in and say, well, you know, here you're not being inclusive in, from a gender perspective. And so like, um, you know, kind of thinking about, and so like, deep engaged critiques. Um, we had, uh, you know, it was interesting, it was online and you can go look at what people said. One of the very interesting things was that a lot of comments came in offline to us. Mm -hmm. So people emailed us separately. Um, actually one person printed out the entire book uh, as a paper and made extensive notes and then handed to me, <laughs> to me one day. So I was like, this is amazing. <laughs> um, That's awesome. Yeah. Um, and so I'm deeply grateful. You know, it, it, I would say on the back end, you know, folks are considering doing something like this. On the back end, then it made the revision process actually a lot harder, I would say, because mm -hmm. we were dealing with many voices and they did not all agree necessarily with each other. Um, and... Um, there was just like a sheer volume of feedback that was a little bit hard to integrate. So we actually did do, we did a lot of rewriting and restructuring between the first draft and the final version, which I think a lot of that is due to the extensive nature of feedback that we received. But I have to say, I believe the work was strengthened so much between that first draft and the final version. And it gave us the real impetus that we needed to do that hard process of rewriting and restructuring, I think. Yes. Um, and it was so helpful to see the ways in which the work wasn't communicating, actually. Like we thought in that first version, for example, our principles were very clear. And in fact, it turned out, we could tell from people's comments, they were not clear. So we were much more, I would say actually like kind of didactic in the final version to kind of really signpost a lot more like here's where we are here's what we're talking about here's this very specific principle mm -hmm. and that kind of thing so yeah that's wonderful uh did you all also receive uh, comments and suggestions from the people whose work you cover in the book that you describe the activists um, there are a lot of really interesting and concrete examples that you cover yes um yeah well, we invited all of them and i will say i interviewed actually conducted interviews with around 10 to 15 um, projects um, that we feature in the book, especially the ones that are kind of lengthier mm -hmm. um, or that we have direct quotes from, uh, because I wanted to be very careful that we are, we were representing their project in a way that they uh, agreed with. Um, so yeah, in some cases, um, we reached out directly to those people to invite them to be these chapter reviewers, for mm -hmm. example. Yeah. Um, and part of that too was of course to make sure, again, like a kind of, kind of accountability thing, like to make sure that um, they were comfortable and on board with the way that we were framing their work. Because in some cases, I mean, we are doing in, in a way what? I think academics do, which is like we're using these case studies and practice to then formulate new concepts or build on concepts. So concepts like missing data or counter data. Um, and so, but we didn't want any person to feel like we're using their work or being extractive basically right. of their work. 
Um, so yeah, so so yeah, a number of those folks included the, the people themselves, as well as the scholarly work that we cite as well. We invited the scholars themselves in, so yeah. That's great. Um, well, I wanted us to turn a bit of uh, attention to the theme of the American uh, Geographical Societies event, which is Geography 2050 Toward a More Equitable Future, and talk about the intersections between data feminism and geography. So uh, what do you see as the relevance of this book, for example, for our understanding of spatial dimensions of inequality? Uh, and how can it help us think through uh, the role of spatial analysis and geography in building a more equitable future? Yeah, thanks. Um, so I'm thinking a lot about these questions right now. So in our uh, department, I teach the uh, GIS and spatial analysis course. And we've just this week actually been talking about uh, ethics of mapping. Um, and so I think there's, there's many connections that I see. Like we wrote the book more broadly about data science. Um, but there's very important ways that these discourses of data science, um, AI, and so on, um, definitely apply to de geospatial data. Um, and in a sense, um, almost needing to be more careful uh, when we're talking about geospatial data and geospatial data science um, because of the ways in which uh, location information can be uh, so sensitive mm -hmm. um, and potentially exposing people to, to harm, depending on um, who's looking at where who is. <laughs> um, so I think there's, there's, there's connections along the lines of um, geospatial data to all of our main concepts. So like in terms of thinking through, like what are the power dynamics of like who produces the data, who, who produces geospatial data in particular, um, who has access to actually do something meaningful uh, with that geospatial data, who, who can make maps and so on. Um, but then unlike the... Um, flip side of that, I think one of the really exciting things, so I think we have to ask what we call like, um, in the book we frame these as who questions. Like mm -hmm. basically we need to examine power and challenge power where we find power to be distributed unequally, we need to challenge power. And I think that certainly applies in relation to geospatial data and mapping. But yeah, like I said, on the flip side, one of the really interesting things about um, geospatial data and mapping in particular is I think it has a really long history of um, sort of civic engagement, participatory mapping, um, indigenous mapping, feminist mapping, all of these are already strands uh, within mapping. So actually I think the, I find that the discourse around power is actually further advanced in a space like geography. And that's actually where we saw a lot of the important work kind of defining the field of critical data studies coming from, because I think we've already had a lot of these conversations over say 40 years around how maps embed these structures of power, they reify these structures of power and so mm -hmm. on. Um, and then I think the other important things we've seen a lot, especially in the past 20 years of um, citizen led projects that engage with mapping. So I'm thinking here specifically of like OpenStreetMap, for example, um, not without its, um, you know, there's important critiques of OpenStreetMap, like I'm thinking of the work of Monica Stevens, for example, along the lines of gender. Um, so it's not like it's this perfect example, but at the same time, it is a really interesting example of a kind of ground up um, production of um, infrastructural geospatial data. Like that is a really, I think, unique, example of that um, and continues to be a really um, vibrant community which can be used in so many different ways. Um, and then, you know, I think there's a lot of uh, activist mapping efforts as well. And so, you know, the map is like a um, form that uh, citizen groups and activist groups sort of turn to as a kind of first stage, um, first stage form of data visualization. Um, and so I think we increasingly see like, and in fact, in the book, we feature a lot of examples of um, work that whether it's about um, eviction data or data about gender-based violence, um, street harassment, and all of these like are, um, have chosen the map and have chosen spatial analysis as their preferred form of um, putting the data out there. So like they're, I think asserting that, um, you know, in 
these struggles to rectify the balance of power at some level, um, this is also about uh, space. So this mm-hmm. is also about space and place. And this is also about uh, rectifying spatial inequalities at the same time as it might be about um, economic inequality, uh, gender inequality, racial inequality, and so on. Um, so I think that like, I find geography and in particular sort of GIS and mapping to be a really uh, rich space, both for analyzing some of the problematics, but also for um, really looking to, to who's working towards more just solutions that are using data in a kind of more positive way, yeah. Wonderful, thank you. Um, and I guess to conclude, um, I wanted to ask you, how are you building on the data feminism framework uh, in your current work and research, and where is that work going moving forward? Yes. Um, so we have a project, and Isa knows actually the answer to the question, <laughs> because uh, because we work together um, on, on a project called uh, Data Against Feminicide. Um, and so one of the cases uh, I just mentioned maps of gender-based violence. Um, In Data Feminism, we feature the work of Maria Salguero, who is a um, uh, something of an activist or a person of civil society um, who has been mapping uh, feminicide, uh, gender-based killings in Mexico for now um, five years. and I was really fascinated by this example. And in fact, interviewed Maria for the book. And now we've, we've since interviewed her again for our project. Um, because of the, um, I would say, highly sophisticated ways in which she is gathering data that are not readily available from uh, sort of institutional sources, um, assembling those data, publishing those data, um, uh, sort of giving them out to activists, to NGOs, to data journalists. Um, she actually has ended up amassing the um, largest public archive of feminicide in the Mexican context. Um, And interestingly, because of this work producing this database, she has been invited to um, speak in front of Mexico's Congress several times. Um, And so digging a little bit more um, into this, um, found that, and in fact, uh, Maria's case is, is not unique. It's not like she's the only person who's doing this. In fact, there are a large number of citizen observatories, um, feminist collectives, uh, data journalism organizations, and more, um, particularly in Latin America, but also in North America. We're looking at sort of both areas. Um, and these are organizations that are uh, scanning media reports. They are looking at institutional, official data sources, all as a way of trying to compile um, uh, data about feminicide. So which um, may or may not, given the context, have legislation that, that defines it or frames it as a problem in some way. Um, and a lot of this is a response to what you might call missing data. So like this, this is not a phenomenon that is adequately addressed or measured by the governments and the um, policies that, that are currently in place. Um, so in any case, this is, this is our current area of focus. Um, we've been interviewing groups that are doing this monitoring um, observatory data production work. Um, and then we're also, uh, you know, it's, we, we also build technology. So we have a design side of the Data Plus Feminism Lab. So we've been looking at how do we build tools to support exactly this kind of um, what we've been calling counter data science. So I would have to um, support um, citizen and civil society led groups um, to be able to work with data in this way and really to use data as a tool for um, uh, holding governments to account, uh, to potentially raising public awareness and public consciousness around specific issues um, and so on. And so that's that's sort of where we're at. And we've been developing these tools and building relationships with, um, with groups. So yeah, that's where we're headed. <laughs> awesome. Uh, thank you, Catherine. Uh, and thank you all for uh, engaging with this work. And we hope that you will take some time to read the book, which is a really wonderful book. Thank you so much.